So on last uh, Friday, we ended off the class by uh, considering this slide which I've put the world the following the separation factor. And I mentioned that the separation factor is something that we're going to see fairly regularly. It's, a one, it's one way that we can quantify how well our separator is doing. It's a generic equation that works on any separation unit where you're separating any two streams from each other. So you select your species by the day, and you select them so that you always have that ratio of exceeding one. So if you've calculated at the values less than one, just flip what you could assign to i and j around, recalculate it, and it will exceed one. So it's very easy um, to, to use that way. You also have to make a decision what you assign as one and two. So one and two there is arbitrarily defined here. Uh, for most systems, uh, one comes up with one two at the bottom, so distillation columns that would be a natural assignment. Cyclones you'll see, sedimentation vessels you'll see today, that, that will be a natural assignment. But again, the equation doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, matter if you, if you need to change one or two around. So you can prove that to yourself. Now, I asked you last time to consider this last statement written over here. Why solid fluid separations have very high separation factors? So you can, you can easily try out that equation with the solid fluid separator that has a good separation. So what do we mean by a system that has good separation? What would we see coming out in one and coming out in two for a system that has really good separation? One will be mostly I and two will be mostly J. Okay, so if you, if you make an assignment where one is mostly, for example, species I and stream two is mostly species J, substituting values into that equation, you, you can show to yourself that you'll get a very large SIJ value. What would be the SIJ separation for a system where we're boiling water, which is salt, we evaporate that water with vapor off and condense it. So my two streams coming off are the condensate and the material remaining that's from the boiler. What would be the separation factor for that system? We were considering separation of salt from water. Separation value of one. What is the characteristic of that stream coming off the top, the condensate? What does it contain? Pure water. Okay, so if we assign stream one to uh, that condensate and we assign water as species I and salt as species J, what is xj going to be in the numerator of xi, uh, xj sub comma 1? Zero. zero. Okay, so I'm going to get a division by zero, I'm going to get infinity. So systems where we get perfect separation have separation factor of, of infinity. What's the lowest separation factor we can get? Zero, one, one. So the, what is the characteristic of a system where you get a separation factor of one? You haven't separated anything. You haven't separated anything. Whatever's coming in here in your inlet stream is just being split and coming out in stream one and two, but in exactly the same molar ratios. So your numerator ratio and your denominator ratios are the same values. You're going to get a separation factor of one. So that's the way we quantify our separators. Either they perform perfectly and then we get a separation factor of infinity or they don't perform at all and we get a separation factor of one. Everything else is in between. Now the other reason why we look at separation factors is because I can operate my units so that I achieve a certain separation factor. Then I can go change my way that I operate the unit. I can alter my mass separating <coughs> agent we spoke about last week. Or I can alter my, my energy separating agents. Or I can alter how much mass separating agents or how much energy separating agents I add to the system and I'm going to get a new SIJ value, a new separation factor. Okay, so with the same system operated in a different manner, I can get different separation factors. And our expectation is that it holds, if you look at, at uh, the literature and if you get values from a company or when you go work in a company and you calculate this for the, for the same system under different Conditions, you can quickly show to yourself that as SIJ gets higher and higher, 
the cost of that unit goes higher as well. So costs of operating the unit and costs of building the unit are in, in proportion to SIJ, that separation factor. Okay. So if I open the tap and I get water out of it from Hamilton's treatment process, there's a certain separation that the city of Hamilton has done in order to get us drinking water. There's a certain separation factor I can calculate. It. It's not pure water by any means coming out. There's dissolved salts and impurities in that water. The cost, though, of getting ultra pure water that you use in, say, pharmaceutical production is extremely high on a cost per liter basis. But then your SIJ factor, the separation factor to obtain that water, is extremely high. There's very, very low levels of impurities in that ultra pure water. And then at the opposite extreme, any lake water or sewage water, that's got ex almost no cost, right? But it's extremely polluted and got a high level of impurities in it. And so just water is a, is a great example of a system where the, the, the greater the purity, the greater the cost, the, the greater the separation factor. Okay? So we're going to use this uh, separation factor over and over in our, our way, as a way to evaluate a system. So today's class we begin though with what we call mechanical separations. These are the easiest separators to understand. Um, you have the knowledge already to, to uh, look at the equations. It's really just a of physics. But the reason why I wanted to introduce it now is because this concept that we're going to learn in today's class, the equations of particles in a fluid and how they behave, is going to carry forward for the next few weeks. Everything is going to build on this uh, really one key equation that we're going to see today. The other reason why I wanted to look at it is many textbooks kind of just shove it off at the end in the last chapter. But really, I'm almost 100% certain that you will encounter a mechanical separator in your career in one form or another. They're, they're so widely used because they're very reliable units. There's, very, there's little or no moving parts in certain instances. Um, they're cheap to operate and they're cheap to build as well and we can get a high separation factor here. So let's take a look at what, uh, what some of those examples are. Well, the one we're going to consider today is sedimentation. Um, we will also then consider screening of particles. We'll look at centrifuges and cyclones in the next few weeks and then filtration after that. And then filtration leads naturally into membranes and membranes are really just another form of mechanical separator. But we'll consider it in a slightly different category. Before we get to uh, these in detail, I would just like to uh, give a slide on each one of these, the magnetic separator and the electrostatic precipitation. These are two that um, are useful to know about. Uh, the first one, magnetic separation, is widely used in the mining industry. It's also used in food manufacturing and drug manufacturing as a way to eliminate any metallic particles from the food or the drug being produced. So you, you, you will likely encounter them in that situation. <coughs> For those of you that go into the mining industry, you may see them in that, um, as illustrated here, where we've got a belt conveying our mixed material. And then there's an induction magnet in, in that belt, which will cause the magnetic particles to travel slightly further than the non-magnetic particles, which leads to our separation. So it's a very simple principle of operation. Um, you can get very high throughputs on these, and you can just make your belt wider and wider if you need to increase your throughput. But the most common context is in the food and pharma industries. The next one is an electrostatic precipitator. Um, similar idea, but this is exploiting a different principle. It's exploiting the conductivity of the material, not its metal uh, magnetic properties. So here we're, uh, we're using a magnetic field. Uh, sorry, we're inducing an electric current, I should say, not a magnetic field. We're using uh, an electric <coughs> at high voltage field, so that's my energy separating agents over there, is the, the voltage that I'm applying, it's the energy I'm putting in, and that's inducing uh, a different conductivity in the material. Again, some of it sticks preferentially, other than others don't, and we, we create a separation. So just a, just a background, very, very straightforward separators. Now let's look at sedimentation for, for today's class. So we actually did see this a little bit in that sugar video uh, from last week. If you go to a minute 4.35, um, 
to five minutes, you can see it again. Let me just uh, re-show it over there. And helps clarify it. In reaction to the lime, the juice's color changes from brown to yellow. Next, the juice goes into these clarifier tanks. It takes over two hours for the juice to settle and for the impurities to fall to the bottom of the tank. A sample taken from the tank shows how the sludge collects at the bottom, while the clarified juice collects at the top. Next, we'll see how this clarified juice transforms into flowing crystals of white sugar. So that was uh, essentially the sedimentation step. And um, we're going to look at that now in detail today. You can also, I mean, it's very straightforward to do this at home. I did this in the class last year, but I don't have a, a, a document camera to, to, to do it here quite easily. But you take concrete powder or dry wool compound, anything that's not going to dissolve in, in water, and you shake it up and watch it settle out. That's exactly the same principle. Um, or vinegar to milk and curdling that will um, cause it to uh, and then let it settle. You'll see that it's the same idea. So you've, you've likely seen sedimentation in practice. Yeah, the definition that we're going to use for our purposes is that we're removing suspended solids from a fluid. And that fluid can be liquid or gas. Um, so we've got our solid particles suspended in that fluid in some form. So dust particles in air is an example of a fluid, which is a gas, or sand in water, that's an example of a solid suspended in a liquid. But, uh, so we're going to use this term fluid to refer either to liquid or gas, but most commonly um, we'll be dealing with the liquid phase rather than the gas phase. Then some other terms that we uh, will use is thickening. Thickening refers to just increasing the solid percentage by some amount, um, but there's not a very high separation factor there. Thickening implies that there may be some solids carried over in the liquid stream still, so you're not getting a pure uh, pure liquid stream. And there's also usually a, a high quantity of liquid remaining in the solid stream. So thickening is low separation factor <coughs> process. Clarification, uh, that was the word that uh, the voiceover in the sugar video the lady used there. Clarifiers are used to remove solids from a relatively dilute stream. So there's very little solids remaining and you're essentially just clarifying or cleaning up that fluid stream from a small amount of suspended solids. We'll also see in a class from now the idea of adding a coagulant or a flocculant to encourage these small particles to create larger particles and settle out faster for us. So we're going to add a mass separating agent as well. Today, in sedimentation, we're relying purely on gravity to do the work for us, and so gravity is our energy <coughs> separating agent, our ESA is gravity. It's for free. Now, we will see these sedimentation vessels. Uh, most of you, or many of you, are taking the civil engineering course, right? The sort of, uh, I think, 404B, 404B or 403. So uh, you, you'll see this uh, coming up in that course. It's also widely used in minerals processing. I've also seen it applied in food processing industries. I've worked at Coca-Cola before, and they just uh, treated a whole bunch of um, sugary water afterwards. They essentially just had their own wastewater treatment plant on site to treat their water before they discharge it into the municipal stream. Um, so they, they had a sedimentation vessel and a clarifier there to do that. So you, you'll see it in a variety of industries, which is why I wanted to cover this topic. So we will look at uh, factors that influence sedimentation, how we can make sedimentation occur faster or slower what uh, aspects will influence that sedimentation rate. We'll look at some basic design of the sedimentation unit, the costs associated with it, and coagulation. So let's, take, let's try to brainstorm here. If you've got a particle suspended in a fluid, so there's my particle in the fluid. So the rest of the board is the fluid. We're just considering that single particle on its own. What's going to influence the rate at which that particle settles out? What factors might be at play here? Uh, the viscosity of the fluid. So the viscosity of the fluid. Other 
other factors. The density of the particle? Density of the particle itself. So if that particle is more dense, we would expect faster segment, right? Brownian motion. Brownian motion might be an aspect over there, so the particle's random movements through the fluid itself. Other factors? Density of the fluid as well. Sorry? Density of the fluid. Density of the fluid. How would that affect it? Uh, sort of buoyancy factor. Okay, so there's a buoyancy due to the fluid. Uh, more dense fluid might settle slower. Settle slower, right? So it's fairly intuitive, the stuff. Anything else? Other factors? Drag forces. Drag forces. Okay, so that particle is going to drag force in which direction? So we've got drag force in that direction. We've got gravitational force in this direction. It's volume of the particle. Volume of the particle. How will that affect it? Larger volume particle. If the larger volume, more surface area, so the volume is going down slower. So it may settle slower for a larger volume particle. But a larger volume particle has greater mass. Greater mass well, it depends on the density of water. Okay, so there's, now we start to see there's some other, uh, it's not just straightforward in one direction that things will that things operate in. So here's, uh, here's some other things. The, the strength of the gravitational field as well. If uh, we were doing this on another planet, um, or if we're doing an environment where we could influence the gravitational field, that will definitely be a factor. The relative density of the particle versus the fluid, so we've got both of those up here. But what we'll see in a minute is that it's actually, actually the difference between the particle density and the fluid density, that delta density, that's, that's, a, that's going to influence the second rate. The viscosity of the fluid, as was mentioned, the particle's concentration. So here we've considered one particle in isolation, but if there's neighboring particles around it, that's going to hinder the set wave. So we'll use to see that term coming up later today. Hindered set wave is when there's a high concentration of particles. The wall of the sedimentation vessel may also be a factor. So if you've got a very narrow sedimentation vessel, so think of a drinking straw and you've got sand particles falling through that, there's a very small Region for its, or there's a high probability it's going to contact the wall of the, of the drinking straw versus a larger diameter vessel. But in general, and this is why I say to a point, the diameter of the vessel or the cross sectional area of the vessel in which we're performing the sedimentation has absolutely no effect. So if I build a sedimentation vessel this big or the diameter of this room, changing the diameter of that vessel has no effect on the rate at which the particles settle. So at no point in our calculations and our equations will we see the cross-sectional area of the unit playing a role. That's really, really interesting. Because it's going to impact how we size these units. When we size the units, the sizing is only going to be a function of the throughput that we need to treat. It's not going to change how fast or how slow the particle is. So that's good to know. To your point. Obviously a very narrow, narrow, like the drinking straw example, that's definitely going to have an effect. But after, after a certain ratio of particle diameter to vessel diameter, so once that ratio of particle diameter to vessel diameter exceeds a certain value, the diameter of the vessel really has no impact at all. Okay, so we've kind of, here what, we've, what I've done is I've explored the various aspects of the problem. So remember back uh, last week, Thursday, I'd said, in this course, I'm going to use a, a systematic problem-solving strategy where we plan our approach, where we explore the problem. Essentially, what I've just done in the last two, three minutes, I've explored the various aspects that are going to be of interest to us in this, uh, in this situation. And I've drawn here on the board um, this particle in the fluid. We've got the drag force. Um, mentioned here, we've got gravitational force, and then the buoyancy force was also measured. So there's a buoyancy force on that particle. So there's the three forces that are 
acting on that particle. There is also the force of Brownian motion and particle-particle interactions. We're going to ignore those for now and assume those don't play a role. Yeah. We're well, we going to assume that the fluid is stagnant or will we do? Okay. The fluid being stagnant. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. That's an interesting one. So right now, we're going to talk about a velocity without Clarify in a minute is we'll call it the relative velocity. So we, we won't deal with velocities absolute, but on a relative basis. Okay, so if I'm considering that particle in the fluid, gravitational force acts downwards in proportional to the mass in the gravitational constant. The mass of the particle m is equal to rho, v, uh, rho p for the particle's density multiplied by the volume of the particle. So the product of those two gives me the mass of the particle. If I assume the particle is spherical, the volume of that particle is proportional to its diameter, given by that formula for the, for the volume of the sphere. So that's a standard assumption we make, is dp is the, rate, uh, the diameter of a spherical particle. We're going to see in a few classes from now, we're going to look at that dp, because obviously our particles are not spherical. But for now, for this derivation, it's a good assumption, and it gets us started. And then later, we're going to we're going to substitute different dp values over there to see what the effect is. The buoyancy force on that particle is in proportion to the volume of fluid displaced. Okay, so volume of fluid, not the volume of the particle. So the volume of fluid that's being displaced is the volume of the particle that multiplied by the density of the fluid. So it's dp rel f this time, and then g the gravitational constant. Okay, let's take a look at drag. That's the one that uh, we need to have a bit more discussion on. So drag force is this force counteracting gravity, and what what might influence drag force? Recall from physics. What, what factors will influence drag? The surface of the particle. The surface area of the particle. Okay, so I'm going to write the area for now. We're going to just clear that up a little bit more carefully. We need to be a little more careful there, but that's a good start, yeah. Or the shape of the particle. The shape of the particle is going to have some, some effect. Absolutely, but we're going to talk about spherical particles for now. So we're going to lock the shape in as being assumed spheres. Okay, but in general, this is the shape will. Yeah. The viscosity of the fluid will affect drag. So what, essentially what we're looking at is drag forces. What factors influence drag forces? So area is one, viscosity of the fluid, the relative velocity of the particle to the fluid. The relative velocity. Okay, so this comes up now as V. V. And we're going to talk, call this the relative velocity. Okay, the key there is the relative velocity. So the, the, the particle is, is moving downwards with a certain velocity. The fluid is generally stagnant for most processes, but it's quite conceivable, and there are a number of separators that exploit an upward stream of the velocity of the fluid. So they flow the fluid up while the particles settle down. Okay? So there, the relative velocity then is smaller, right? Because the particles are settling, but you've got a counteracting velocity from the fluid. So the velocity value that we use in the equations then becomes a smaller number. So we'll be absolutely clear that the velocity we're referring to is relative velocity. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Any other factors that would play a role here? So like, uh, the initial velocity of the particle when it's drawn on the surface. Okay, so there's the, the, the initial velocity will, will have an effect. That's true. We're going to ignore the dynamics and assume that things are just operating in steady state so we've reached terminal set of velocity. So that first few seconds for the particle to go from its initial velocity to whatever its terminal velocity is, we're ignoring that time frame. It's small relative to the time frame we're dealing with in sedimentation. 
Okay, so the flow of the surrounding liquid would be there. So that's where this relative velocity comes in. Okay, so we've got a few a few factors here. The area was one mentioned, the row, the density of the fluid was one that didn't come up, velocity came up. And then we've got this factor C D. So C D is what we're really talking about here. So this drag force is op operating in this direction against the gravitational force. We're going to get a higher drag force at faster velocities, in fact, to the quadratic. So faster velocities, greater drag forces acting against us. Higher areas, AP, the projected area of the particle, larger the surface area of the particle, the higher the drag force. All of that's intuitive. The CD is not quite so intuitive. CD is just a constant, dimensionless, as you can see from the, the units over there on the right, that modifies what that drag force calculation is. And CD is a function of, as Mark mentioned, whether the fluid that we're in is, or whether the system that we're in is turbulent or lambda. So CD then is broken down into four regimes as a function of Reynolds number. So depending on the relative velocity, so V here is a relative velocity that factors into the Reynolds number's numerator, the density of the particle, sorry, the diameter of the particle, the density of the fluid and the viscosity of the fluid. So standard Reynolds number calculation. But notice though that rho and mu refer to the fluid and not the particle. So in the Reynolds calculation, it refers to the surrounding environment and the fluid that the particle is in. So for small Reynolds numbers, C is inversely proportional to the Reynolds number. This next regime is also true. It's also, again, inversely proportional, but not quite so much. Uh, we get, it gets modified. And then after a certain Reynolds number, so for more in the turbulent regions, uh, C is, in fact, constant. So it's, it's, it's quite nice to look at this graphically. For very, for very laminar systems, our drag coefficient is actually very high for very, very laminar systems. The system becomes more and more turbulent, drag coefficient drops off. So this is, this is what we recall from physics. Right? This is not something that's new to us, or it may be um, obvious just from our daily experiences. So the key thing, though, is not just to go ahead and use these equations indiscriminately. Think about what's actually going on here. That this drag force, the velocity term over there, the row of the, the, the density of the fluid term, that makes intuitive sense. The AP is the projected area of the particle. That also makes intuitive sense. Let's just talk about that for a minute. So if we have a sphere falling down on the fluid, the projected area refers to is as the fluid sees the particle coming towards it. So it's the projected area. It's in fact this cross-sectional area of the sphere at the widest point. So it's simply just the projected area of a circle with the radius dp. So AP then is not, it's not the surface area of the, the sphere's bottom part. <laughs> AP is the projected area. So if I, projection essentially means if I took a flashlight over here and I shone a flashlight, what is the shadow going to be? The shadow is simply a circle with a certain diameter dp. So ap then is the projected area of that circle with the diameter dp. It's not the surface area of the bottom half of the sphere, as you might, might suspect. So if we look at that, all those forces, and we do a momentum balance, we can, we can calculate the momentum of this particle, where it's simply the, the sum of those forces acting on it. And we set it equal to zero because, as I, as I mentioned, we're really not interested too much in that initial period for it to reach steady state. Most of these particles reach steady state very rapidly. That uh, equation up there settles out to zero. 
and we can then just look at the sum of the forces acting on that particle and balance them out. So we've got gravity acting down, buoyancy up, and drag acting up. So the signs, signs work in there. I substitute in the, the terms from the equations we had before. And what we can solve for is the terminal velocity. So I can solve for V, that equation up here, it's got a V squared, so my solution for the terminal settling velocity, TSV, is a function of the square root. And inside that square root is exactly what I expected. All these terms, as we had spoken about earlier when we were looking at how what's going to influence the sedimentation rate, makes sense here. Larger diameter particles are going to settle faster. But it's not a linear relationship. So if I double the diameter, my velocity doesn't double. Okay, so it's not linear. Stronger gravitational field, higher velocity, larger density difference. So if the density between my fluid and my particle is greater, so think of sand in water versus sand in air. Sand in air just settles right down instantly. But sand in water is going to go a little slower. So that density difference is actually what's important here for us. Density of the fluid. More dense fluid, slower velocity. Okay? And then my drag coefficient. You can go substitute in what CD is. CD is a function of inverse Reynolds number. And then you can go substitute in what Reynolds number is further still and make sure that the relationship between viscosity and density of the fluid makes sense. Yeah, Mark. So there's liquid or gas. It's all just fluid. It's all just fluid. Whether you're dealing with liquid or gas, rho f is, is, is whatever your surrounding fluid is. So this makes, makes intuitive sense for us. This equation is also going to be the key equation we're going to use for sedimentation, but we're also going to see this used in centrifuges. So when we design a centrifuge, a centrifuge is nothing more than particles separated in, uh, particles suspended in liquid phase. And so it is, this works as well, except in a centrifuge, my force isn't gravity anymore. My centrifuge force is this radial spinning force. So we're simply going to substitute a different value, a different term for G. Okay, but this is the basis for centrifuges as well. Questions on this so far? This derivation is straightforward. Okay. So we've got a problem though when we want to use this equation. And we're going to see it come up in a minute. If we make this assumption, however, that the Reynolds number is less than 1, we can actually work with this equation quite nicely. So recall, Reynolds number less than 1 means that the drag coefficient CB is 24 over the Reynolds number. And then, when I have that value, as long as your Reynolds number is less than 1, I can sub in 24 here in the denominator, the Reynolds number in the numerator, and sub in the symbols for the Reynolds number, and that equation simplifies a little further still, and we get um, this situation over here. Velocity in an environment with low Reynolds number is given by that equation. So they're, they're the two identical equations. This equation up here, TSV is the more general of the two. It holds in every situation, as long as those other prior assumptions are met. In other words, no hindered, no hindered um, settling, and we've ignored ground in motion. But this equation holds in every case. This equation over here only holds for the situation where Reynolds number is less than one. So it's a simpler equation to work with, but only holds in a limited region. But how do we know that Reynolds number is less than 1? What do you need to calculate Reynolds number? You need the velocity to calculate the Reynolds number. Okay. But you need the Reynolds number then to calculate the drag force. And then the drag force is then used to calculate the velocity. So you're going to be going around in circles here, right? So we need to break this in some way. So here's... Um, Here's our approach for solving for the terminal second velocity. We don't know if Reynolds number is less than 1 or greater than 1 or one of those other bounds. So we simply make this assumption at the start. Assume my Reynolds number is less than 1. It's also called the Stokes region. 
knowing that I can solve for the velocity using the equation on the previous slide. So that's this guy over here. The simple equation. Assuming Reynolds number is less than 1, I know what G is. I know the diameter of my particles. I know the viscosity of my fluids. I know the density of the particle and the fluids, respectively. So easy to calculate velocity. Once I have velocity, I can then sub in to the Reynolds number. So dPv, the velocity I've just calculated, multiplied by the density of the fluid and divided by the viscosity of the fluid. So Reynolds number, now I can do a, a quick check. Was that assumption met or not? Okay, if it was met, I am great. I've got my terminal settling velocity and my problem is finished. But if Reynolds number was not greater than 1, let's say Reynolds number was 1,000 to 500 from that calculation, then I have to go back and calculate the CP from this side, 17. So if Reynolds number, for example, was 1,000, I now have to go re refine my, my, my drag force coefficient CD. Now I've got a new drag force coefficient CD. Then I go to this equation over here on slide 19. Sub in that, that constant value for CD. I know the other terms in my equation and can calculate the velocity. Check Reynolds number again. Okay. If you do this three or four times, it quickly converges. So you should never have to do more than a handful of iterations on this to calculate the terminal of the cost. Okay, so this is, uh, that's uh, great. So let's do this example quick. Spend a few minutes, three, three minutes or so, and work through this example. This was a question from the assignment last year. You've got a particle one millimeter in diameter. That density calculate its terminal step and velocity.
Okay, so density of water. Viscosity of water. One, sorry? One times ten to the negative three Pascal seconds. Okay, so two numbers. Density of water is, is, is well known, but viscosity of water is a number you must know off the top of your head. It's one centipoise points or zero point zero zero one Pascal seconds if you're in metric. So that viscosity of water at ambient conditions, 20 degrees. Okay. So we've actually, what, you, what you've done here is, uh, remember we said we want to use a systematic problem solving strategy. So the first thing we need to do is just define our problem. Uh, what are the knowns and what are the unknowns? So when we're defining that, uh, here's an unknown that we, we needed. We needed the, the density of the fluid that we're in, which is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. We also know a few other things. The particle diameter is 1 milliliter, so dp is 0 0.001 meters. We know the density of the fluid, uh, oh, sorry, the density of the particle, I should say, is given to us at 5,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And our goal is to find the terminal second velocity. So define your problem first. What you know, what you don't know, what's given to us. Is this some information given to us, some other information is known from prior experience. The next step is to explore the problem. So We've done some of that already um, in the discussion just prior to this. We've looked at what factors will influence the terminal setting velocity. Um, so we're, we're comfortable with that already. We, during the explore phase, you also look at um, things like assumptions. So we've assumed in our derivation that we're not being influenced by a wall or other particles. So when we're exploring the problem here, also simply state, assume no other particles hinder the same way. Okay. So look at look at things like boundary conditions that might modify how you approach this problem. In this case it's very straightforward. There's an isolated particle being considered in a large body of water, so it's straightforward, but it's not always the case. So explore different ways in which this problem could be answered. Is it a routine problem? Is, it, is there something that you need to do a little bit differently than ordinarily taught? The next step is to plan the problem. You plan your approach, I should say. And there's the plan written up here for us really in those six steps. So, we don't need to do that right now because we've, we've actually just covered it, but that would be your approach. Now, I don't expect you to write out your plan in an assignment or in a, especially in an exam. There's, there's less time for that. But even if the next step, which is to execute your answer or do it, even if while you're doing it, you label the steps as step one, assume Reynolds number is less than one, step two, solve for B. So you, you can merge your plan into your use plan in a test or exam only because you're constrained for time. But in general, you would plan separately and then go do it after that and execute your steps one at a time. So in this case, if, we, if we're looking at actually answering the question, what we do is we'll follow that plan. So assuming Reynolds number is less than one, so I'll simply just use numbers to refer to those steps from the plan up on the, on the screen there. Assuming Reynolds number is less than one, we can calculate our velocity. So did anyone calculate that bit? So 2.18 meters per second. So I won't go through the calculations there, it's simply simple substitution into the equation on slide 20, 2.18 meters per second. Then let's calculate the, the Reynolds number, so solve that is step 2. Step 3 is to calculate Reynolds number, 
with that velocity of 2.18 meters per second and knowing the diameter of the particle which was given to us, the velocity which was calculated, with the density of the fluid and the viscosity of the fluid which we know, we can calculate that in Reynolds number as 2180. Okay. So Reynolds number much, much greater than what we had originally assumed. So we we don't follow step four, we're not complete yet, so let's go recalculate our Reynolds number. So Reynolds number, looking at the table then for the situation where we're over 2,000, uh, sorry, it's the telephone again, it's Okay, so we're in this middle, uh, this third bracket over here. So Reynolds number then, um, I should say CD rather, is 0.44. So we've now got our revised CD value. I can then kind of use this equation over here. This time is 0.345 meters per second. So uh, it's substantially changed. The last two here was originally 2.18 meters per second. Assuming I'm in a fairly laminar environment, now I realize I'm actually not. My velocity is actually much slower. I've got greater drag forces operating on that particle. So if I now use my revised estimate of the Reynolds number, so the next estimate for the Reynolds based on that new velocity is 345 as well. So I'm in this second region over here. So my revised CD value then comes out to be 0.65. So greater drag forces on that particle, and then the next velocity I calculate using the generic terminal settling velocity equation. So this is from TSV again, is equal to 0.28 meters per second. the calculation one more time, it doesn't change by very much. It converges to 0.27 meters per second on the next iteration. So if I sub in that velocity to my Reynolds number, recalculate Reynolds, recalculate CD, these numbers don't change very much. So I've converged. Yeah. Would you just check the Reynolds number and if, it, if that stays the same, then you would say that? Right. So yeah, I, I, if I repeated this calculation, Reynolds doesn't change by very much. I don't have the exact number here, but it will barely change. The CD obviously uh, won't change, and then the velocity you recalculate from that revised value is 0.27. So that's the final answer, 0.27, or 0.28. Uh, so, so that's the approach we'll follow. There's two more steps actually in the problem solving strategy, which I will talk about a bit and demonstrate in future examples. Um, and then, so tomorrow's class, we'll look at index sending, or sorry, Thursday's class.